views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Public Health America, a 30-minute program on BronxNet where we talk with national experts to promote health and social justice. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We begin by focusing on a current health topic from the COVID pandemic to cardiovascular disease. Our goal is to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. On Public Health America, we also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings and opportunity, and champion the ability to engage in civil debate. But for many, finding a path to college is neither clear nor certain. What if you're a high school student with supportive parents but feel daunted by the prospect of being the first in your family to attend college? What if you're a single mother or father and want to attend college but have no childcare? On Public Health America, our expert will also talk about decisions they made and support they received that helped them beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It is a pleasure to have with me today, Dr. Tiffany Pennyman Dyer, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Maryland. Tiffany, welcome. Thank you so much for having me today, Dr. Latimer. Thank you. And you, you must call me Bill. Okay. See, you did your postdoc with me. I was. Uh, and, uh, and I've known you for I don't know how many years, but, uh, and I will call you Tiffany if that's okay. Okay, good, that's perfect. Great. So I know you've been doing some, uh, you've done a great deal of work and some really fabulous work. Mm -hmm. Some of what you've been doing lately is looking at hesitancy that some folks have mm -hmm. to take the COVID vaccine. Uh, yeah. Set the table, tell us the work you're doing and, and what are the lessons you've learned so far? Okay, well, so far, thank you so much for that. So um, in terms of infectious disease, most of my work is around drug dependence and, and infectious disease, as you know. But we've been hit with this pandemic and have left a lot of people wondering, when are we going to reach the end of this pandemic tunnel? And as a Black epidemiologist, I understand the hesitancy. Black people historically have been included in studies without proper consent, not knowing what the overarching goals of the studies were, et cetera. Um, so I understand why people of color in general, Black people specifically, are side-eyeing this whole vaccine situation. But I think of it this way. We may not know what the vaccines do in the long run, right? We're thinking about in terms of a perspective, you know, sort of study. But we do know what coronavirus does in the short run, right? In the short term. And so I think it is really um, up to us to be um, sensitive to that and then also have a sense of responsibility, not only for ourselves, our families, but our community as a whole, right? And so I think there's a reason to be hesitant but I think we really need to be proactive um, as a community and as a people just to eliminate the risk if we can. So is it fair to say, and I don't mean to oversimplify, but that hesitancy is a kind of exceedingly long-term and justified yeah. trust issue with healthcare, with respect to communities of color, and that we need to repair that to the extent that we can to promote health among communities of color. Is that yes. fair? That wasn't oversimplifying it at all. That was a perfect way to put it. That's exactly it. So I think it, the onus is on the medical community and the research community to repair that. Um, that could take, we don't know how long it's gonna take if, if people really want to actually do these things. But I think as a member of that community, that there is some level of proactive action that, that we should also take to protect our community. So there's a lot of undoing that needs to be done. You, you've just mentioned two or three very important points. Let's focus on one at a time. Let's talk about community outreach on the part of higher education institutions and uh, public policy uh, you know, institutions. Um, what what should we do here? Are we reaching out to churches? Are we reaching out 
to community-based agencies? Are we reaching out to FQHCs? What are the, are there best practices that have some proven track record to align with communities to foster health behavior? I do. I think that we reach out to all of those uh, organizations that you just mentioned. We think about like faith-based communities. We think about so for people who do community-based participatory research, right? So we start with the community. And so we want to meet the community members where they are, engage the stakeholders. That takes a lot of time, right? To develop trust in a community that has often, again, not been fully informed about what people are coming into the community to do, or they come in and do something and then they fly away. We call it helicopter research. Nobody ever sees them again. They're like, I don't know, I was in a study. We're not really sure, right? And so we can engage people in, in barber shops, um, at our local you know, grocery store, which again, if you live in a food swamp or desert, there aren't many, um, but in areas where people are, are just there, right? So even when we think about engaging people in a healthcare setting, that's still going to um, exclude a certain segment of the population who may not have health care um, or access to health care or insurance or, or at transportation or housing or all of these other things that might prevent them from going into seek care that's seemingly available to them. So I would say engage them where you can find them, wherever that is. While I'm, I've missed it for decades, I will make a commitment to go to a barbershop to get a shave. <laughs> And I will engage. I knew you were going to say that in yes. a conversation. Yes, that's all uh, it starts with. Yeah, to promote health. Yes, uh, that's it. Very good. So, Tiffany, tell us a little bit more about your work, uh, whether through uh, vaccine safety or other kinds of things that you're working on. Mm -hmm. What What are the kinds of uh, ways in which you have been able to move the needle to promote health uh, in urban communities? So we have a few faculty at University of Maryland who are on the front lines of vaccine research. That would be uh, Dr. Kraus Quinn, um, Dr. Stephen Thomas, and of course, Dr. Don Milton, who was in our department. So my, someone asked me, um, one of my line sisters, I'm a Delta, so one of my fans asked me to write an op-ed for The Wave, which is the largest community like publication in Los Angeles. We used to get it at, my, at home in Compton. Um, and to write this op-ed about vaccine hesitancy. And so uh, when I wrote the piece, I was, you know, I put the researcher hat on. I was like, oh, I need to come with some stats. I need some citations, you know. And then I was like, no, 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 no. This is where we fall short. Um, confusing people, adding terminologies, epidemiologists. Nobody knows what that is except until now. Um, and just kind of speak to people, just meet them where they are. Just like you said, at, at the barbershop. People want to be healthy. And so we just have to find ways to engage people in a way that they that people understand. You know, it just it's really it's just it's really being it's just just be human with with folks. So we talk about SDOH, right? So uh, social determinants of health, and a lot of times it, it goes beyond that. So now we have to think about structural determinants, socio political determinants, um, policy determinants of public health. So again, moving beyond. Even the social is an individual, but it feels like it is. It's sort of like, well, you live in that neighborhood. So, and it's kind of like, well, I live in this neighborhood because of some of the structural stuff that has occurred that doesn't allow me the opportunity to expand myself outside of the four corners of the block that I live in, right? And so how do we untangle some of those things, right? So that, and this goes back to the question or, or the point that you made, which is undoing the injustices that have been done to people um, since the beginning and, and how do we really come together? But I think it requires two, two sets of people at the table. So it's gotta be, everyone has to have the same goal in mind and then how do we reach that center, whatever that goal is. Everybody is a, is a participant um, and it requires some tears. It's gonna require a little bit of hurt feelings. It's gonna require some people walking out the room, closing the door. It just, it just might be that, but it requires us all to come back into that room. When you're doing that important work, mm -hmm. are there outcome measures mm -hmm. that you conceptualize or think of concretely 
that you that you work to achieve. And I'm going to be very specific. So, uh -huh. for example, we can look at epidemiology. We can look at national data uh -huh. and know how many adults have gotten one or two uh -huh. shots of vaccine by state. Uh -huh. We can look at a place like the Bronx that has significantly lower rates uh -huh. of vaccine uptake than, say, Manhattan. Uh -huh. There's no question that we need to engage the community, that we need to engage in uh, places of worship and barbershop uh -huh. uh -huh. and fire stations and uh -huh. every other place we can imagine. But what is our goal? What are we do? Do we want to set targets to achieve, or is it more the process of just building relationships, or is it a little of both? It's a little of both. I'm glad that you put it that way, because I do think that as part of the research community, we do, and and you know that we set targets. So how do we know that whatever work that we're doing has impact? And even the, the definition of impact, it differs, you know, from discipline to discipline or from person to person. Like, how do you really, really know that the work that you've done has had an impact? And, and, and so now I'm thinking impact. I think about policy impact. But I also think about, like you're saying, just the process of doing this is in itself a, a study, if you will. It's how do we do this? How do we help people? be informed about their own health care and, and, and to take action with that and to feel like the actions that they take are purposeful and and will somehow help us reach those targets, right? So sometimes we go like above and beyond, like you said, is it too simple or too, too complicated? So I think sometimes it's too complicated. You don't want to tell the community, uh, well, you can, right, what those targets are, but to meet those targets, these are the steps that it takes for us to reach that goal. And we might not even see that goal, Bill. We, it, it, I don't even know where that is, right? So I think saying, you know, what what's the prevalence of, you know, or the proportion of the population who have had two doses of the vaccine? That's a, that's a, I, I like that because it is quantifiable. Um, it's something that you can, again, quantify. And you can say, look, we did it. Or there's a certain percentage or proportion who's only had one. Um, you can say, hey, we're behind the mark here. We need to do something. We need to, to strategize, maybe have some more marketing and health literacy programs so that we can help under, people understand just this, these are the benefits. We just have a, a minute left in this segment. Tiffany, if there was, a, what's, the, what's the next step in the line of your research? I'm working with Dr. Khan, as we know. And so I think what we really want to do now is start to engage. So we, we do research. I call it do research in certain communities. But I think the next step is how do we have the, the community sit at the table as scholars? You don't have to have 75 letters behind your name to be a scholar. You're a scholar of your life. And so how do we bring people in to have some say in what the next steps are? What is it that we need to be doing so that we can increase or at least achieve some level of health equity in bringing people to the table who might not have had a chance to be at that table? I love that phrase. You are a scholar of your life. Absolutely. I love that. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break. When we okay. return, Dr. Tiffany Pennyman Dyer is going to tell us a little bit about her personal story that led her to this uh, fabulous career and led her to the University of Maryland, a really great institution. We'll be back in a bit with Public Health America. Welcome back to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It is my pleasure to have Dr. Tiffany Pennyman Dyer, Associate Professor of Epidemiology of the University of Maryland, join us. Tiffany, in this segment, it's, it's my favorite part of the show. We talk to our guests to get a sense of their personal journey, challenges they faced and met to get to college, get through college, and then have a career as opposed to a job. If I may, the first question I always ask is, where were you born and what were some of your formative experiences? Thank you so much, Bill. Um, 
So I am a native of Compton, California. I was born in, um, I always like to say a suburb of Los Angeles. Nobody, and everybody's like, what you, nobody calls it that. I'm like, it's a suburb of Los Angeles. It really is. And so I was born and raised in Compton. Still, that's where my mom is now. And I would say I had um, very, um, my parents did go to college, but the neighborhood that I grew up in was is still middle class. So they are college educated folks. That being said, I was born in the 70s, around the 80s, uh, mid to late 80s, 90s, the crack ep epidemic really kind of hit. I'll say the inner city. And so during those more formative years, it, I, my, my family wasn't victim to that, but the neighborhood was. And so there weren't a lot of examples of people who were, you know, going to, you know, go to college. Um, my parents did put me in private school. Now, that might seem like it was a benefit, and it really was. However, being someone from Compton at that private school, I remember the um, college counselor telling me, not to apply to a four-year university, that I should just apply to Compton College because that would be where I was going to be going. Wow. And this is despite me having a 4.0, um, despite me being in AP classes, despite me being student body president, besides me being captain of the defense, I did all the things. And that was what they told me. Now, this is the 80s, so it, there was no internet. So I had to write into UCLA, USC, boo, but whatever, it's great and get the applications and apply. And when I achieved getting into all of the universities, I went back to that office and I was like, I'd say she was a nun, it was a, it was a, it was a, I went to Catholic school and I did tell her that I was, I mean, I was in tears. I was like, you, you literally tried to deter me from what my future could have been. Um, I went to UCLA um, and there is, I think, where I really got the a first, my first sense of, I'll say, um, I'll call it Pan-Africanism and black excellence. And even though I came from a family of excellent folks, black people, it never was something that was really instilled in me as a be a proud black person kind of thing. And it was at UCLA where I developed that sense of self. Um, simultaneous with that, I also became a statistic because I got pregnant with my son as, when I was a teenager. Um, and after graduating, decided that I got the, a, an opportunity to be a health educator. And my job was to go to schools in, in LA Unified in Inglewood to talk to kids about how not to get pregnant or get HIV or STDs. That was my job. Um, after that, I realized I had a lot of skill, but not the education. I had my bachelor's degree in neuroscience, but I didn't have a master's in public health. I didn't know what that was. I said, what is this MPH? And I was like, oh, I went to school to get my MPH and then continued on to UCLA to get my PhD. Um, I, I really wanted to have the opportunity to ha have a voice in terms of the types of thing research that's conducted in communities of color. I wanted to have a seat at that table to say, this is how we reduce high rates of teen pregnancy in the inner city. But it was one of those experiences that really solidified, I think, the importance of higher education and the importance of, I'll say, taking advantage of an opportunity if it presents itself to I'll say put yourself in a position where you feel like you have a seat at that table, whatever that table is. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, like people who aren't educated, but there is there's that there is that there's that nugget that's there that really says and what it really shows, I think, is I think is perseverance. Like you have this goal and you're able to like see it through like the whole way, like whatever that is. And I think that's something that we need to tell our young folks that that you deserve a seat at the table. And this is one of the ways that you ensure that. Tiffany, you just said so much. Uh, I did. <laughs> and thank you so much for your kind words. Certainly it's obligatory, but I must say, I know you would have succeeded without me, though I'm grateful that you were a part of the team that we created Absolutely. with so many other uh, ex truly exceptional uh, doctoral and postdoctoral students and faculty. Mm -hmm. um, there's one comment I want to make because I think it's just so important. Mm -hmm. You know, there, look, I didn't know her. I don't know what motivated her. I don't want to know, and I don't need to know. Mm -hmm. I will simply say this. 
if one lesson from your amazing trajectory is that if anyone gives you guidance that delimits your horizon, oh. don't believe them. Absolutely. That's that's the take. That's one takeaway from your wonderful story. So I just want to, I want to, I want to highlight that because, you know, we often talk about the things that are done right uh-huh. and everybody's comfortable, uh, uncomfortable to talk about the things that are done wrong. Yeah. Things are done wrong yeah. sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And uh, so the two part message is if someone tries to delimit your journey, don't listen to them Uh -uh. and find somebody who sees the spark in you and can uh, help you to the next level. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize you were talking about my story. (laughs) When you said, I don't know who she is, you said delimit the part. I was like, oh, this is some poet said something about delimiting. (laughs) And I was like, oh, wait. (laughs) Yeah, that is exactly the take home. That is exactly it. My whole life would have been different had I said, okay, I'll just do what yeah. you suggest, right? It could have it could have been completely different. On your path along the way, uh, I mean, look, you know, when you talk about UCLA and Johns Hopkins, you're talking about heavy hitters. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and Maryland is a, is a phenomenal oh. institution, mm-hmm. aside from yours truly. Were there key mentors along the way that kind of uh, inspired you or helped you to that next phase? Yeah, definitely. I would say as an undergraduate, I, was, I wasn't I was quite as, I'll say aware. I'll say, think, thinking back, I, I realized that I sort of wanted to attach myself to certain professors at UCLA. I, I will, I, I'll say this though, I do recall as a doctoral student, and as a master's student as well, I like the part that you said about the spark because that's the piece, right? You see a little spark and you kind of want to be along to see that flame sort of ignite um, along this person's journey. Like there's there's no guarantee, right? And so I will say that, um, and this is, I, I, I say this because I have mentors, I have black mentors, white mentors, male, female, gender non-binary. I've got mentors across all the spectrums, right? And I know a lot of times we want to say as a black person, want to, you know, be like, I'm seeking out a, a, a black mentor. That's got to be it. I think obviously you can have multiple mentors. You should have a, a litany, like there should, you should have like 10 mentors and, but be very clear about what it is that you want from that relationship and what you're going to give to that relationship is bi-directional. So you're not just getting, getting, getting it right. And so most of the, so some of the mentors that I had, I'll say, um, and they've, like passed away, you know, Dr. Cunningham, Steve Shopta, obviously Bill Latimer. And um, I asked one of them before he passed away, I said, what made you take me under your wing? Because I remember students saying, you got an interview with Dr. Cunningham? Like I've been emailing him like all year. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. And he said, I saw a lot of me in you. You were insecure, you weren't sure of yourself. But I could tell that you were, you know, a little bit smart, but but you weren't really sure. So you didn't walk around the halls of UCLA like, mm, I deserve to be here, boom, boom, bam. You know, you're always, it's the imposter syndrome. Like somebody's going to figure out at some point that I'm not supposed to be here. You know what I'm saying? And I still live with that right now. Like who's going to, somebody's going to pull the rug up from under me at some point. Right? And so when you Find someone who has an interest in helping you develop yourself professionally, but also personally, Bill. You know that, right? So it's not just how do you write manuscripts? How do you do this? It's building your esteem and just being able to walk into a room and say, I deserve to be in this room. Again, I deserve a seat at this table. Then you've got to be able to cultivate that relationship. And I think that that's something that you and I have done. And I married your wife as well. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I have... You know, I'm in the Latimer, I'm in the family, you know what I mean? But it's also, I, you saw something as well. And so it's like, how do we keep that relationship alive? It's like any other relationship. It's a marriage, it's a parenting, whatever the thing is. Keeping you know, it alive. A couple points. I think something you said that just, I think is just so important and that I think is so meaningful for our audience to hear. And I, in this 
uh, I'm so old now that it's hard to remember, <laughs> but uh, the, what you called or referred to as the imposter syndrome, you know, this feeling like you're going to be found out despite mm -hmm. all the incredibly, you know, uh, amazing work you've done. But, but the thing is, is I think that so many young people that absolutely must go to college yeah. have some of might, might, I don't know everyone, mm -hmm. I don't know their experience. Mm -hmm. I'm simply saying might have a little bit of that feeling in them the way I did and the way you did years ago. And to hear someone so accomplished as you to say that you sometimes still feel like that mm -hmm. now is I think so important and incredibly humanizing. I think the second point I wanna make with just a moment left is that I'm not sure, but you're, you may be the only postdoc that worked with me. And then after that with my wife, Dr. Maria Khan, <laughs> who then was at University of Maryland and, uh, and you still very closely. And, uh, and I know that she, she sends her love and yes. enjoys uh, the work that she does with you. Yes. I have to say this bill before we go, I have to say University of Maryland. And I'm, I, if, if this, if anyone sees this, like, they will kill me if I don't say it. I have to make the distinction with college park. Yeah, because we do have the Baltimore. No, it's not you. It's not you. Yep. No, University of Maryland, College, College Park. Park. Yes. Otherwise, Absolutely. it'll be like, dun, dun, dun. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and but, and I, I, I will completely separate from you say University of Maryland, Baltimore is also a good school. It is excellent. <laughs> I'm an affiliate faculty. It's excellent. Ex they have the, they have, we collaborate with School of Social Work, Nursing, Law, everything. Wonderful. All University System of Maryland, but I am at College Park. Outstanding. Yeah. So I'm going to, I have 20 seconds left. I'm going to leave us with, so proof positive that I am so often unconscious, but sometimes it is serendipitous. My unconsciousness is serendipitous because when I brought you on as a postdoc and one of the strongest postdocs I've ever had in my life, I didn't realize you were related to Richard Pennyman, in effect, one of the most important musicians, songwriters, vocalists, uh, force of nature of the 20th century in that he is your uncle. Yeah. Uh, but I, I simply want to acknowledge uh, his genius and say, I'm going to request that BronxNet do an hour long show on his life. And I hope that you will help us with that show at your convenience. Absolutely. And so that's another example before you let me go is that I, I bore witness to excellence in my family, right? I didn't know who he was. I just was like, Uncle Richard, just, you know, everybody's trying to eat some, you know, some Thanksgiving situations, you know what I'm saying? And then, so my family's either like nurses and they went to school, 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 or then this my uncle is an entertainer, right? And so I saw excellence, but it was just in a different way. So I want to thank Dr. Tiffany Pennyman Dyer, Associate Professor of the University of Maryland, College Park of Epidemiology. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to thank our viewers for tuning in. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. See you next time here on Public Health America. Take care.